Well, good evening and welcome to the CAF Warbird 2, a show where we talk about warbirds, about history, World War II, flying, and much, much more. This show is supported by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. This nonprofit membership organization has preserved and flown historic aircraft for more than 65 years. CAF's mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. If you'd like to support the CAF's efforts around the country and around the world, you can do so through donations, membership, or by volunteering your time and talents. Visit commemorativeairforce.org for more information. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and we'd like to welcome everyone watching tonight. If you're on uh, Facebook, YouTube, or uh, GoToMeeting, we're glad to have you here on whatever platform you're watching. If you would, just take a second to like, share, subscribe, and follow us. That always helps. And not only helps us, but helps you keep track of the upcoming shows that we have for you. And we've got a number of really interesting guests, including our guests tonight uh, in, in the uh, coming weeks and months. So uh, this episode, we're going to take a look at the ever-expanding world of 3D modeling, both on computers and the new technology of 3D printing. If at any time you have any questions, just go ahead and type them in the chat box uh, on whatever platform you're on, and we'll uh, do the best to address them either within the program or we'll save some time at the end to uh, answer any questions that uh, we didn't get to. So right now, joining us from the CAF B-29, B-24 squadron is Conley Kelly. Con, great to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Steve. All right, I'm, I'm, I hope we have a good time tonight. Uh, my name is Conley Kelly, as Steve mentioned, and I'm, um, I kind of coined my own term for my company and my, my, my product that I put out, Short First Fuse Productions, and there's my website. But I'm an avid scale and 3D modeler. I've been doing scale modeling for years, and I picked up 3D modeling about 25 years ago. I'm in the Commemorative Air Force as a member of the B-29, B-24 squadron that have been in uh, this unit for 12 years. I'm the education officer currently. For the squadron, I'm also maybe the resident modeling nerd. <laughs> I think every squadron needs a modeling nerd. And then I've worked at Dallas College as an employee for 25 years doing corporate training. So we have an agenda tonight that we're going to try to get through. But I wanted to ask you if you have kids, invite your kids to watch this. This is kind of kid friendly and it's got a lot of 3D in there. And I know they see that a lot of that in their entertainment and games and so forth. Also, I think you might want to take some notes. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot of references to history including different museums that have inspired work. So I might want to jot some things down so you can go back to them later. But we're going to talk about 3D modeling and popular culture. And then uh, we're going to look at a step-by-step -step 3D modeling case study using a software I use called Strata. And we're not going to look at the actual software, but we're going to look at screenshots. And then I'm going to talk about what inspires my art, the uh, best work I've done, and I, I think, and some lessons I've learned along the way doing that. And, and obviously how history ties into everything. Um, I don't make mythical dragons or uh, creatures and things like that that some folks might do in the game design world. I decided to take my 3D and, and approach World War II history primarily as my subject matter. So we're gonna learn about how 3D is used in multimedia. We're gonna hopefully look at how you could plan a 3D project and look at the software again. And um, I love playing Tanks to Ships of World War II, so we're gonna have a lot of history thrown in I think you'll enjoy. So, Avengers Assemble. So modeling history honors heroes, and I love the Avengers. I've seen all the movies. But do you want to see my 3D Avenger? This is my 3D Avenger. It's a Navy torpedo bomber from World War II called an Avenger. And this one was famously flown by our 41st US President, George H.W. Bush. In World War II, and you should be able to see my laser pointer, he was one of the youngest Navy pilots in history made 58 combat missions and 128 carrier landings but by the age of 20. So I, const he constitutes a hero for me and I've made a 3D model of his airplane and a scale model of his airplane. And you'll see throughout the presentation, I like to make both. I'm gonna show you how these two hobbies relate, connect to each other. And here's an example right here. But let's look at 3D and popular culture in the movies, for example. You have examples here in the collage the lion from uh, 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 Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I think that's what it's called, and Spider-Man, and Shrek, and the Scooby from Scooby-Doo, and uh, you can see like, my highlighter here, King Kong, and uh, Avengers, and Star Trek, and Star Wars, and so forth. But let me call your attention over here to this silver man and the, the fire behind him. That's the liquid Terminator from Terminator 2 in 1991. I think that's probably the best, one of the best first examples of using a 3D character as a principal part of the plot of a movie 
And then to the left, you have Avatar from 2009. Almost that entire movie was carried by 3D models. Now, these are made by high-end shops like Industrial Light and Magic, Digital Domain, and Weta Digital, and Pixar. Pixar, of course, has made some wonderful family-friendly movies. They're beautifully rendered. Uh, the stories are so good. Uh, they're Academy Award winners, if that's a testament to the quality of these movies. So um, you can see a variety of them here. It all started in 1995 with Toy Story. But who created Pixar? John Lasseter. John Lasseter is the founder of Pixar. And when I worked at a film school in Los Angeles, he came and spoke about Toy Story. Now, I wasn't really supposed to get autographs from celebrities came to our film school, but I wanted his. I think I saw 3D in my future. So he signed a Buzz Lightyear poster on the back of his car. And uh, I noted here his car did not have eyeballs. <laughs> and then you have 3D and TV. You have classic things like Star Wars and documentaries like dog fights and commercials. Over here you have Jimmy Neutron, which was made right here in Dallas by a company called DNA. It had some interesting looking 3D and a nice run on Nickelodeon. Then over here you have Allie McBeal from the late 90s. What makes that show unique is she had a dancing baby that she would hallucinate, had something to do with her uh, concerns about having babies later in life. And that was made with a software called 3D Studio Max. You could buy that at any store right off the shelf. So now you didn't have to work for a high-end digital or 3D company to make something that could be used in entertainment. This uh, polar bear ad's kind of neat because that's the Coca-Cola polar bears, of course. Rhythm and Hughes made that uh, uh, campaign and they spoke at the film school. Somebody in the audience said, I love the campaign, the, the bears are cute, but they don't talk and they grunt a little bit. And maybe that would scare children. What do you think of that? And the guy from Rhythm and Hughes said, well, we studied polar bears and their natural element, and most of the time their fur is covered from the blood of their last kill. So we don't think they're that scary. So then 3D and games. Um, obviously, they're playing all kinds of devices, very popular. You have your first person shoot 'em ups like Halo and Call of Duty. Uh, this one's called Spawn. You have sports games. This one over here, I'm hopefully my highlighter's on. It's called Minecraft. That's used in a lot of STEM programs. You got your franchise games racing games and so forth. This is how games looked when I started playing them in the 90s. You have Doom and Wolfenstein, crude looking, but still a lot of fun. Wolfenstein had a World War II concept attached to it. But like a lot of these World War II games that and the kids are playing them, they're not that accurate. This one definitely not, because at the end of the game, you fought a giant robotic Hitler. <laughs> but I finished the game, and I also got a nasty case of carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, this game I wanted to talk about, though, because Myst, when it came out in the 90s, was groundbreaking. Made by two brothers, Robin and Rand Miller. Uh, they were instant millionaires. It was one of the top-selling games for 10 years. Also, the inspiration for the TV show Lost. It was made with Strata 3D. And what you see in some of these screenshots here are beautifully rendered images. I mean, pretty much uh, real, very realistic looking. And you travel through the game and solve puzzles and unlock clues and so forth. It was so addictive and a lot of fun. Strata 3D was the software we taught at my film school. So I decided I wanted to learn it. So we're gonna look at my background and some early work and inspiration, including here, my example of my Strata created a sailing ship and it's spelled with a K because I spell Constellation with my name spelled with a K. But here you have one of my first models made way back in 1993. I made a P-38 Lightning. And over here to the right is the film school. I made that in 3D as well, and we used that in some advertising. But the P-38 Lightning, I think not bad for a first try. I was just learning it. I have it dogfighting with a zero. This down here is interesting because this is not a 3D model. These are scale models, but they're photographed and put in Photoshop. We're going to be talking about Photoshop. It's an integral part of 3D modeling. So in this case, I use Photoshop to combine two scale models into a scene. But just to divert, uh, we're, I'm in Hollywood working, and my wife worked at Paramount Pictures on Star Trek The Next Generation. So this is actually Photoshop. I'm not really on the set with the characters here, but that was a lot of fun for us at the time. And we were seat fillers at events, if you've seen that in some of the news lately. And I worked at uh, the American Film Institute. We had different events honoring celebrities, and this one honored Clint Eastwood, and I made the party invitation. And this is the music from The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. You can read music, and he was a musician, so I hope he he liked that. But at one point, uh, we had 
an event where our baby, my baby daughter Katie and, and my wife and I went to this event and Charlton Heston was donating his staff from the Ten Commandments to MGM Studios Disneyland. So we got into the picture and there he is holding his staff. So that's Katie, me, Moses and Mickey all in the same picture. And then uh, even though I'm in LA, I'm married to a Texas girl, I was fascinated with Texas history. So I started making the Alamo. I've been to the Alamo a few times when I visited Texas and uh, thought I'd make the compound, but the internet didn't exist. So I had books that I could look at and I had a movie, the John Wayne movie. So I started making the Alamo compound and this is all made in Strata. So you put your camera at different places in the compound and render an image. This is probably my best image. This depicts the famous crossing of the line where Colonel Travis did a line in the sand and dared the Texas Patriots to come over for the final battle. So I rendered this and I liked it and I decided I would email it to the Daughters of the Republic of Texas and see what they thought of it. So I waited for them to write back and they wrote back and said, Mr. Kelly, we really liked your image, but the Alamo didn't have a roof on it in 1836. This is a uh, Planetoids, a game concept I was fooling around with at film school. I just didn't have the programming skills, so I couldn't get it developed, but I wanted to be a game designer. And when we had our, our daughter Katie, which you saw, we decided to move back to Dallas to be closer to her folks. So I started interviewing at companies. Um, one of them, instead of turning in a resume, they wanted me to make a 3D model. So I made this slobbering monster. I wasn't successful. And one of the places had showers and beds. <laughs> They expected people to work there all night on projects. So maybe that's for the best because I got a job at Richland College, which is a, a big community college in Dallas. And I picked up a teaching spot. I taught a 3D class, but I used instead of Strata, something called Caligari True Space. And one of the projects in the class, me being an aviation modeling nerd, was the Bread Baron's airplane. And I approached it like a scale model project. We had the uh, 3D model kit and the uh, students put the model together and spun the propeller and uh, figured out texture mapping and everything else. Who was the Red Baron's greatest adversary? Snoopy, of course. And I, so I made a Snoopy with True Space. Well, let's, let's look at how it's done. This is my model, the Spirit of St. Louis. And this is your first shot of a uh, scene with Strata. This is a screenshot showing what are called the different views. You have front, back, right, you have uh, left, uh, you have isometric. So you can look at the model in different ways. This is in wireframe mode. And you have different tools at top that allow you to make shapes. And then you have a tool palette that allows you to manipulate shapes. And then you have a lighting palette. And this is called the texture palette. Uh, you're gonna look at another view here. So now at this point, you see my camera pointing at the plane. I'm gonna render the Spirit of St. Louis using ray tracing, which is a higher end rendering option. So here it is in all its glory. Uh, Ray tracing really makes your texture map pop and your shadows look good. I already had a background ready. And then I wanted to animate it. So when you animate something in 3D, you have a timeline. And in this timeline, you see keyframes. Those are those diamonds. And then the computer interpolates what's between those keyframes. So I'm moving my Spirit of St. Louis slightly to the right. And then I'm going to animate it. So let's see if this works. So hopefully you just saw did you see it, Steve? Flew on by. You flew on by, good, okay. That's my uh, Spirit of St. Louis, and you might have noticed the engine noise. I grabbed some pretty special effects, and that was a Spitfire engine, so I'll have to get a Spirit of St. Louis engine noise. But let's look at starting a project. This is a famous airplane from World War II, PBY Catalina. So starting any project, you're gonna do your research. And I have uh, a great library of books now, and. Building a model kit is probably one of the best reference points for making a 3D model. So here's some uh, books like the Walk Around book from Squadron. What's cool about that book is it shows you all different um, angles of the plane, inside, outside, close-ups. So it really helps you look at the different shapes and way the plane looks. And then if you build it, like I like to build it, I want to put it in a historical context. So this is a PBY uh, flown by Lieutenant Howard Addy, who uh, spotted the enemy fleet, Japanese enemy fleet heading toward Midway. And um, I remember when I built this model about 25 years ago, being on a chat room and he was in the chat room talking about the Battle Midway and about the movie in 1976. So that was pretty cool. Uh, if you're gonna build the model, um, I mean, of course you're gonna build the model. Let's use a, a US World War II destroyer as our, our featured model here. 
the model kit instructions are often a great way to be the guide for your 3D model because you're putting the ships together and steps and it's assembly. So the model kit instructions can be a lot of help to guide your uh, path when you make the 3D model. Let's make a five inch gun, very common on a Fletcher class destroyer. Here you can see the wire frame of the gun and a new palette that's showing up at the bottom here called the shape palette. So you're gonna see more of that in the next few shots. So this is an exploded view of the wire frame of the gun. Now these are two tools in, in Strata you can use. This one's called extrude. You can take a 2D object and extrude it. So you can extrude it, make a solid 3D object. And this one, I even beveled the edge a little bit to give you that round curvature that you'd have on a uh, five inch gun. This one's called lathe. It almost sounds like you're in a machine shop. And this one, I've taken it and I'm gonna go around the uh, 2D image and it'll create a 3D image of the gun with a hollow center. So here's the exploded view in Strata. And now I put a texture map on it. Pretty simple, I mean, uh, light grays and dark grays on a Navy destroyer of the time. And here's a cool shot of the Fletcher with all the different sub assemblies that went into it. What's neat about 3D modeling is once you create one five inch gun, clone it. Now, now, now you have five five inch guns common on a ship like this. Two smokestacks, two, two depth charge rack, two light boats. So it's a really neat way to model because you can uh, go at such a rapid pace once you get your original model built. So here's the Fletcher and all of her glory. Uh, I've added the sea and sky and smoke with Photoshop being stocked by zero. And um, I just wanna point out because I, I did a lot of modeling over the pandemic that uh, Greyhound came out as I think the, one of the first mainstream movies that came out during the pandemic uh, through Apple TV. And that had a Fletcher class destroyer in it. It was the USS Kid from uh, Baton Rouge. That's what they used for the shots of the actors. And then they used a lot of 3D models uh, for both and, and the sea and the clouds and the submarines, of course. I was so inspired by the movie, I made two scale models. So here's an example of a movie I liked. I made scale models and kind of extended the experience for me. So here's the Fletcher in a, another very historical moment, the Doolittle Raid. And I know we just had a, a segment in Warburg Tube about that with the granddaughter of Jimmy Doolittle. Uh, here's a, was it Jimmy Doolittle? I think it was Jimmy Doolittle, not Dick, here's Dick Cole. Uh, Dick Cole was Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot. And I met him in 2013. So uh, that was quite an honor. And here's, I've also now made the 3D uh, USS Hornet, which launched the Doolittle Raiders. And here's uh, Katie, my daughter, all grown up. Steve was at this event. Uh, she sang the national anthem in front of Colonel Cole and some other STEAM World War II veterans. And uh, here's Colonel Cole with her. Now, I wanted to make a scale model of his plane, but I didn't have a model built. So I painted two right wings and then I had him sign them. And then I've made one since and I did a lot of customization. You're about scratch building in your scale models. I have a Mark Twain bomb site and I have a figure of him and a co-pilot seat, Japanese friendship medals and so forth. So you can have a lot of fun scratch building. Here's the Fletcher at the Battle of Midway. So I've replaced the B-25s with uh, torpedo bombers, uh, uh, devastators and wildcats. And of course the 80th anniversary is coming up. Now, I don't know um, what y'all thought of the movie. The movie came out in 2019. Uh, of Midway. And I appreciate movies like this, even though it was Hollywood and it had some of those faults. We were able to see these planes and ships and the best 3D money could buy and all their glory again after 80 years. So that was quite a, a neat experience. And then I like the throwback poster and my best friend and I went to the movie and there's Steve uh, talking to a Midway veteran in front of the Dauntless at Wings Over Dallas. And, and I got so inspired, I made a couple different uh, Dauntless models for Dick Fest. I love that they focused on real heroes from the battle. But you know what? You can't, the two midways, because the 1976 movie is very special to me. Uh, here's Charlton Heston again, called his son Tiger in the movie. You've seen it, I've seen it a thousand times. But I like this movie, of course, because it had a great cast. It focused only on Battle Midway. Uh, actual combat footage made it, added some dignity to the movie. John Williams scored it. But I was 10 years old and I saw this in Sense Around where they, rigged woofers or whatever to rattle your seats when the bombs went off. So I love this movie and I made every model from the movie. Uh, when I talk about inspiration, my friend Roy Grinnell was an a, a inspiration for me for many years. We were very good friends and we collaborated on things. He's got a lot of artwork at the CIF here in Dallas and I have a piece behind me uh, called Raid on the China Coast. So we lost Roy in 2019. Uh, I still stay in touch with his wife, Irene, and 
she says aviation art doesn't have to match your sofa. I love that. And you can go to the website and, and get his art. But uh, this is a particularly neat one for me because I have the art. And then, voila, I have, I have the model in my stash. So I, I made a model that's B25 during the lockdown. And I wondered, is this the, one of the first original uh, Angry Birds? And then I made another model during the lockdown. I had enough supplies to make a scale model of a, a bear cat. And so now I have all the Grumman cats in one picture, the Wildcat, Hellcat, and Bear Cat. And I was able to fulfill my, my dream. I wouldn't have a meme where I could say, yeah, I'm the guy who lives with three cats. And I posted that on Facebook. Well, my wife reminded me that I live with five cats, including yeah. our two additions, Fred and Ethel Pertz. So uh, one other thing you can do is if, you, if you're out making the model, you can buy a lot of these models on the internet or uh, wherever. Um, in fact, there's a summary that you can buy at different versions for around $90. And I know this has helped. There's a knockoff movie about Midway where they bought uh, a lot of the models and saved a lot of money. They didn't have to have, have them built. So you can get them from different um, outfits. I got one a long time ago from Viewpoint Data Labs. So this is the U-boat that I got. I added some extras like the texture mapping and the, uh, some of the detail on the ship. And I made a scale model of it. And, and so it made the sea floor. So that was kind of neat. And then something you can do with Photoshop and 3D. And this is really taking the technologies and throwing them all together. Is here's an adventure. But this is an adventure that fought in the Atlantic and hunted submarines. So I've taken a scale model of that plane and combined it with a 3D model of the U-boat. And so created that action scene. That was kind of fun. And then there's a, there's a unit here in Dallas called the DFW Wing that has a Navy version of a C-47 R4D that actually is a combat veteran and bombed a U-boat. And here's um, a T-shirt they have down there. And I replicated it in, um, in 3D uh, using Strata. And then I even created another image with what this plane usually does at air shows, and that's dropping paratroops out. And you can see their hangar there. And I know I'm excited because they're going to have their air show this now uh, this year. I love to go to the air show every uh, late August. Uh, they also have a car show. But let's talk about a key part of 3D modeling now. It's called texture mapping. Uh, here's a P40 we're going to use as an example. But first, let's look at the basics. Here's a 2D image of the Earth, a 3D sphere made in strata. And then you just apply the texture map to the sphere and that gets your 3D model. There's a little butt map on here that makes it look even more 3D. Same concept with the P40. I made the 2D image, made a little overlap and I've attached it to the 3D model. So this is neat because here you can see the wireframe and the rendered image together and then a fully rendered image. And then just another little history fun piece here, the um, Cavanaugh Flight Museum in Dallas has a beautiful P40 that they fly at air shows. And it's in the markings for General Charles Bond. Um, I met him. He uh, lived in a retirement community here, wrote a, uh, his, a diary about his experience with AVG. And he's the artist in the group. He was the first to paint the shark teeth on his flying tiger, which is something that Britza did, but he brought it to the AVG. And also at the time, you know the history of them, Disney knew about the flying tigers and he created a flying tiger for their airplanes. And you can see that symbol, but Charlie created a, uh, another image for his squadron called the first pursuit pursuit squadron of adam and eve and eve chasing adam around an apple it's called first pursuit but the first time he did it he painted the apple red and they said that's not a good idea because on the side of the plane you don't want a big red object so he ended up painting it green uh 3d people you got to have somebody to crew the ships and fly the planes so here's a pt-109 what attacked pt-109 oh, no it wasn't this it wasn't not a rubber ducky, but that model for monogram was really a fun bathtub floater. But here's a um, PT-109 when I made it being attacked by a Japanese float plane. So fun, I rendered it and created the ocean and the spray from the ship all in, in, in uh, Photoshop. But I needed people and the strata that I use is not a great organic modeler. So I did the best I could and I also used my own face <laughs> for Lieutenant Kennedy. So it doesn't look great close up, but if you look at them in the, from the distance, it looks pretty good. And the funny thing is my face is on everybody. Uh, but then D-Day is another great example of a subject from World War II that you can model. So here's a piece on D-Day. And here I see, here's the 101st Airborne over Normandy. So I've made the C-47, of course, the uh, paratrooper, and then the sky and the flak and everything in Photoshop later. This is a neat shot because you're looking up at the planes. And there's a texture map tool in Strata where you can tell it to be 
transparent, or slightly opaque, so you can actually see a C47 through the uh, parachute here. But uh, I have made a lot of scale models, believe me, uh, even a lot as an adult. This is my most special. And the reason it's my most special is because my wife went on a field trip several years ago to Europe with her high school, and she was able to bring back some sand from Omaha Beach. So I made this guy Rama with soldiers from the 29th attacking, uh, you know, hitting the beach at Normandy, uh, Omaha Beach. And I have sand sprinkled from Omaha Beach on the diorama. So that's why that one is really special. So keep in mind, practice makes perfect. This is a lightning built in 2015. So look at the improvement. I think there's a lot of improvement there. And this one, again, a history piece was flown by Major Richard Vaughn, one of our top USAs from World War II. He had 40 aer aerial victories and was sadly killed on August 6, 1945, the same day we dropped the atomic bomb. In fact, the newspaper headlines had atomic bomb and Major Vaughn killed an accident right next to each other. So you can see the texture mapping and everything. It really turned out nice and he shot down a Japanese Tony. So from a 3D standpoint, if you were to look at this 3D, I mean, excuse me, this scale tank, the King Tiger from the Battle of Bulge, maybe you can look at it from the perspective of a 3D model. How do I make the wheels? How do I clone the wheels? How do I make the tracks? How do I make this texture map that's really unique on here? How can I make other parts of the model and put it all together? So maybe you got a little a hint of that just for the presentation, but this is the fun part. I'm going to show you my best stuff that I I think I've done to date. So we're going to walk through some of this. Uh, if you live in Texas, um, we have a great museum here, the USS Lexington, the museum by the bay. And in 2007, I was in a scout troop with my son Curtis, and we got to go down to the Lexington and do the liveaboard program, which means you can stay the night on the ship. So we had a great time. We, uh, with the whole scout troop, and got my Kurt's patent shot there, got a patch and everything. So. He's doing the whole experience of the ship with the docents and all the artifacts and everything else. I'm taking pictures of the ship because I'm creating a photo library for my 3D model to come. So here's the Lexington in 3D. Very complex model. It really tested my skills what, about 20 years ago. So here are different shots of the ship and uh, even have a Tomcat on there. We're going to look at that in a second. But it, I thought it was fun. It really came out pretty good and I'm proud of the model and I've shown it Lexington and they liked it too. So it's kind of a little fun test, but I think you can tell the difference, which is real or which is 3D. So here I've taken a actual photograph on the ship of a Tomcat on the ship and try to actually recreate it in 3D right next, next to there. And I then there have to have a propeller on it to interest me sometimes. So I've made a F-14 Tomcat and here's Tom Cruise um, who made, of course, the F-14 famous. Hopefully we'll see Top Gun 2 soon. <laughs> so another scout trip, we went to NASA. Uh, uh, we went to NASA and we uh, saw the battleship Texas after on the way back from NASA. I said, let's go see it. Uh, so we went to see the Texas and it was actually December 7th when we were there. So kind of eerie being there on that day. This is the only ship remaining from the fleet destroyed at Pearl Harbor. And so um, here's Kurt touring the ship. So did I make a 3D model of the battleship Texas? No, we made a really cool Pinewood Derby car. Anyway, I have made a battleship. I've made the battleship Bismarck. And if you know your World War II history, uh, early uh, spring of uh, 1941, it was the most powerful and dangerous ship afloat. And it was a, a tremendous threat to the convoy system. So uh, just a huge, massive battleship. And I've got some uh, renders there. You can see of my model. You can see a few more, including one of the, when it was in its trial phases and it was camouflaged a little differently. But I also want to tell you from, again, taking your notes, uh, you can go on YouTube and see a lot of war movies. And my favorite, one of my favorite movies of all time is Sink the Bismarck from 1960. You can see the whole movie on YouTube for free. And uh, I loved it because it really did show how the Admiralty you know, reacted to the, the hood sinking and then hunted the Bismarck. So here's my model Bismarck. Now, it's a little too big for the bathtub, but here it is in the pool. Uh, turned out kind of neat. It's a really big model, 27 inches long. And this is the 3D model, uh, duking it out with the hood. Of course, they fired each other from miles away. And uh, the hood, unfortunately, took the shot that caused it to explode. And uh, 1,300 British sailors killed in almost an instant, with only three survivors. So that created the, the, the call you know, from Winston Churchill, everybody sink the Bismarck. And then this is another image of that. Uh, you can see the Prince Eugen, which was escorting the Bismarck. And, uh, 
Uh, this is neat because I use something called HDR toning and Photoshop to even make it pop more. But even on my website, I've, I've really made a whole study of the Bismarck, including the swordfish attack and everything else. So uh, let's see if this works. This is the Bismarck sister ship, Tirpitz. Did you see a gun firing, Steve? <laughs> Happy there. There oh, did you see a gun firing? Oh, good. Yep. Okay. Well, that's using a, a video package I had called Pyromania back then, and you just add that to your Adobe Premiere video and that sound effect. So that was fun. Uh, bent wing birds. So these are two great subjects to 3D uh, F4U Corsair and Astuka, both with their wings bent. And I imagine it had something to do with their purpose as dive bombers or maybe in the Corsairs. Uh, uh, purpose maybe because it needed to have a huge propeller so the landing gear is maybe extended a little farther of course by the bent wing which enabled it to have a propeller that size so one of my early models just a, a blast to build it always been fascinated with the Corsair uh, and I built a version from the Korean War and uh, seen a really nice looking Corsair at Vought Aircraft once so I replicated the scale model and there's the 3D model it's interesting, you may have noticed this, but I do pie wedges for my propellers. And of course, the later model, of course, there had four, four propeller blades. And that was something a model told me once. It simulates the look of a spinning propeller when I've animated the propeller. Same thing, because I really can't do the blur when I'm animating in 3D. And I heard some CAF guys at Wings Over Dallas say that they're part of the devotion, uh, the movie coming out about Jesse Brown, the Navy aviator. aviator. So that's the uh, Adam Marcos book. So that'll be neat when that comes out. So uh, Aces stories, uh, I've built scale models of the Aces and their figures. So here are two of the most, probably most famous Aces from World War II that survived the war. Saburo Sakai and Pepe Boynton both published biographies just a year from each other, autobi autobiographies. And um, I lived in Fres uh, Madera, California near Fresno when I was uh, in the 70s, when I was about 10 years old, 12 years old. And we had an air show every year. And at the time, Baba Black Sheep with Robert Conrad was on. Well, Pappy Boynton lived in Fresno and died in Fresno. Well, he, when he was healthy enough, he'd come out to the air show. So I saw Pappy Boynton at, at the air shows at, when the show was hot on TV. Uh, so I made his Corsair in 3D. And there's Medal of Honor Sip of Pappy Boynton with his classic look. Uh, here are two Stukas, like I did the Tomcat. I got the 3D model and a scale model. Now, Stuka is one of my favorite models growing up as a kid, and I made it. I just love this one, especially with the big snake on the side. So here's another way the two copies re, uh, relate. Here is a decal sheet from that model Stuka. Well, if you scan it, you can use elements of that in Photoshop to make your texture map for the 3D Stuka. But the rule of thumb is scan it before you put it on your model, right, Steve? <laughs> Makes sense. You can't really put your model on the computer. So here's some uh, perspectives of the Stuka. Uh, great model, a lot of fun to make. Uh, one of my more recent models has been a, a P-47 uh, Thunderbolt. And this one was flown by Dave Schilling. Uh, he had Hairless Joe on the nose, which was a little Abner character. And he uh, went on to have quite a combat record. We all get to meet some wonderful veterans, Steve, myself, Lee, and others in the CAF. Jack Bradshaw would come out to many, many air shows. And he uh, flew with Dave Schilling, in fact, I remember what Jack, Jack told me, J Dave Schilling was his best man at when Jack got married uh, during the war. So they knew each other and that's kind of a neat tie in and Jack passed away a couple of years ago. What a great guy. And then uh, a lot of us, Steve Lee and all of us, we meet photographers of air shows and Lyle Jasma has photographed this great shot of a modern warbird and the markings for Hairless Joe, a uh, great photographer. So because I've made Schilling's plane, Gabby's plane isn't too different. If you know the World War II history, Gabby was our top ace in the European theater. So I was able to make his plane, add the invasion strides with texture mapping. And uh, also, I made a really pristine 3D uh, Fock Wolf. So now I have these two planes that can dogfight each other, and I'm, I'm going to be printing them pretty soon, the 3D models of these. It'll be fun to paint. So there's Gabby. And then um, I've always been fascinated by this story. This was a model kit you could get at Michaels and all the stores in town. It's Oscar Perdomo's uh, P-47 from the Pacific Theater. And it's an end model, which meant it was configured so it could go greater distances, carry more fuel. So it wasn't too much tweaking in 3D to tweak the model a little bit and make it look like an end model. And here he is. He was um, 
um, Hispanic. And I, I think I read in his bio that his one of his ancestors rode with Pancho Villa. So I think he's an interesting story maybe for the Hispanic community, like we have Red Tails for the African American community, because he went on to become the last ace of World War II. He shot down five planes, I think a day or two before the official uh, uh, surrender by the Japanese. Roar Grinnell uh, painted the cover of this great coffee table book. And then of course I've made the model. So kind of finish off the airplanes here. I was able to achieve a dream and put, this is one scene. I put four of my 3D airplanes flown by famous aces, aces most associated with these aircraft in one scene. So that's pretty neat. There's one we're gonna see in a minute, George Preddy. And I don't know if you know a lot about him. I'll cover him in just a second. But we're gonna talk about a tank real quick <laughs> because I wanna, tanks are also part of World War II, of course. And this one in particular was inspired by a great film. I don't know how many times you've seen it, Steve. I've seen it a million times. Sahara with Humphrey Bogart, 1943. So I wanted to make uh, Lulu Bell, his tank from the movie. And at the time I had two M3 Lee tank kits. So I said to my wife, honey, let's bond. Let's both make a model at the same time. You can experience my hobby. So this is her tank. This is not Lulu Bell, folks. <laughs> this is the version that she made, but it, I love it. It's, it's the only model I have in my office at work. We call it the Beverly Hills tank. This is uh, Lulu Bell with a little bogey figure getting a drink and uh, turned out really good. And you have General Rommel, the Desert Fox there. I love making figures. And then I made the 3D model, one of the most complex models I've ever made. You can see in the wireframe, all the elements that went into this. It was an amazing project for me. I just loved it and uh, uh, very fulfilling. Here's Lulu Bell on the battlefield, a couple of shots of Lulu Bell. And then, uh oh. I've combined this, the snake Stuka is now dive bombing Lulu Bell. So uh, it's a near miss. Uh, I've done World War II, of course, a lot, but I did jump ahead and want to honor the, and, and connect myself to the history of the veterans from Desert Storm. So I've made a 3D Ab Abrams tank and an Apache helicopter and the 3D, of course, the scale model. So great subject matter, heroes all. What an amazing tank that is too. What a beast. And uh, well, now we're going to talk about a couple of my favorite airplanes. Here's Diamond Lil, which is uh, one of the planes that my squadron maintains. And uh, we're very honored to have Diamond Lil, our B-24, and Fifi, our B-29. I'm one of the officers. I'm the education officer. So I'm very proud and humbled to be part of the uh, part of the group, maybe gu guiding the future of these aircraft right now. And uh, this this one, if you don't know a lot of the history, was built. Uh, of course, we did a webinar a while back, didn't we? A podcast. Too. But this one was built um, in 1941. It was the 25th one built out of 18,000. Uh, it's an A model. A, a lot of the planes that came later were built by Henry Ford and Rosie the Riveter at Willow Run. So I'm gonna make a 3D model. Boy, am I lucky. I have a plane that's here. I'm gonna photograph and look at all the time when it's in town. So I photographed Diamond Lil. I've been uh, through her, taking pictures of all kinds. So here she is in 3D, one of my first attempts at 3D modeling, Diamond Lil. So I have the neutrality flag on one side, Diamond Lil's nose art on the other side. I might be the only person in history to ever model a B-24A Liberator because I, I'm sure people have modeled the later models in 3D. So I made it and then um, uh, I've combined both of the bombers because I've made a B-29 as well. So here they are flying together, which they probably are now. They're in Huntsville, Alabama this week on tour. Please go see them if you're out there. And I get a true honor of flying on the planes as crew. And this is me right there uh, before we took off on Diamond Lil. Because I have a B-24 model in the same way I can make 3D models of other B-24s. And this is probably the most, it's the most famous B-24 mission, the Pulaski Raid. So I've made a, a B-24, a couple B-24s from that mission, which result, resulted in five Medal of Honor recipients, three of those posthumously given, uh, most for any single air action in USAF history. If you don't know the story, please look it up. It's an amazing story of heroism. And then, the gentleman in the corner here, that's Robert Phillips. He's a friend of mine that I met out here and he was in our unit and the CAF. And he flew the last Pulaski mission. There are many missions afterwards to try to take out this oil refinery. And he passed away a few years ago and I was able to get his hat. So I wear his hat on special occasions. I also made a model of course for Robert and I made his model grumpy. And that was his plan. I customized decals and made a 3D model and he kept it right by his TV and uh, he loved it. So. It's really a privilege to do that for him, and I miss him uh, a lot. Uh, Unbroken was um, a 
came out a couple years ago. Uh, obviously, the book was very popular. A lot of kids read it in school. So I've made here Superman, which is the plane that Lou Zamperini was in at the beginning of the movie, Dogfighting a Zero, because it was in the Pacific Theater. Uh, here's another B-24 I made for my friend Alex Mina. He's a filmmaker here in the Dallas area. And uh, we have a big educational banner that hangs on Diamond Lil uh, when it goes on tour. And the big, the big picture in the banner of the crew is his dad's crew. His dad was a radio operator on the Irishman Shanty. And he's making a documentary about his dad and what uh, happened to that unit. And so looking forward to seeing that. I've seen some of the early work on it. It's beautiful. So I'm glad to be good friends with Alex. Uh, Steve, Lee, and all, all of us know that Diamond is a magnet for reenactors. I've never been to the Reading, Pennsylvania show, but I hear that's one of the best there is for reenactors. And uh, uh, this is actually taken there by a photographer at, with Diamond Lil, so it turned out really nice. All right, just before the V29, I got to talk about the Mustang. Uh, Mustang is a great modeling subject. Of course, this is the uh, P51 Cadillac of the Sky uh, Mustang. And this one won an art contest, I got third place, so I'm really proud of that. But this one's kind of fun because you saw my website, Short Fuse Productions. Well, this plane was flown by a, a pilot named Robert Turner. Uh, no, excuse me, Eugene Dick Turner. Uh, the Major Turner. And he originally had nose art that said Short Fuse Sally. And if I understand it right, he broke up with Sally. So his final P-51 said Short Fuse. <laughs> so I went ahead and made it because it you know, kind of tied in with my website. Here's Preddy. Preddy was our top Mustang ace in World War II. Uh, very cool looking plane here. Uh, it uh, has a bright blue nose. The reason it has a lot of red and white on it is his uh, crew chief was a barber in civilian life. So he's got a lot of red and white motifs and a barber pole antenna, then even a barber pole on the side of the plane. So he, uh, he might have been our top ace ever, but sadly on Christmas Day, 1944, he was uh, flying ground level chasing some enemy planes and he was hit by friendly fire and killed. So tragically, we lost uh, George Preddy on that day. Red Tails, great history story. Of course, what wonderful story about the achievements of the Red Tails. And here's uh, Roscoe Brown's P-51 Bunny. And he famously shot down a, a German jet, an ME-262. So I made an ME-262 in 3D, and I was able to create the scene. I've had a lot of fun by both my Red Tail 3D and scale models. Brat's a uh, warbird that flies with PP once in a while with our unit. It's the base Cavanaugh Flight Museum in Dallas. Give it a picture here at the Vintage Flying Museum in Fort Worth of the two aircraft together. So I was able to model the Brat, also a World War II veteran. Here's our Red Nose, which uh, is a very famous CAF plane because it was the first one purchased by the CAF, if I know the history right, for $2,500 in 1957. And it's worth, well, it's priceless now, really. So I, uh, I've been on tour with VP and I have a picture I took of Red Tails uh, flying uh, with VP in Memphis. And then I've made both models and um, now it's at Air Base Georgia, if I'm not mistaken, Steve, right? So yes. you can see Red Tails right. there on or on tour. All right, last but not least, uh, uh, wonderful VP, uh, just amazing. I got involved in the CAF back in 2010. I heard there's a B-29 coming to, to Texas and I got really excited about it. So I I, I, get, I ended up being invited to a, a meeting and got involved and it's been one of the best things I've ever done in my life. So uh, I've also had a chance, of course, to make models of BP. And uh, how can you not be inspired by a picture like this? So here's BP and all her beauty and, and flying over the Capitol. And now the Victor Agathur hangar at CAF uh, uh, Air Base in South Dallas. So uh, and then uh, if you're taking notes. Uh, there's some websites about the tour that's underway now there. She's traveling the country with Diamond Lil. So I had the just extreme privilege and honor of crewing these planes after going through training. And in this one, we were doing a photo shoot and I'm in, I'm in Diamond Lil at this, at this point. She's got a door on one side, but on the other side, she has an open window. And so this is my view. So, wow, I mean, does it get any better than this? Total bucket list time to see a B-29 flying like that in an open window. So, and that's a 50 caliber machine gun. <laughs> so here's uh just some crew shots uh going out with pp and the classic no shot and everybody says it kind of looks like star wars so han and chewie next to me right <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know, between two of the pilots and the nose of pp so 
lots of fun to go out with Fifi. So now let's look at the scale model. So I've made a scale model. This is 70 second scale with custom decals. You can see the decals, but are those decals gonna be used again? Yeah, they're gonna be used in the 3D model. So here are some initial applications to the texture map for the 3D model of Fifi. And at the time, I don't know why I was making Fifi the lettering in black, because I think it wasn't black at one time, right, Steve? So I got confused <laughs> early on when I made the model, but now, now it's in blue, which is appropriate. And we've been able to use the model as, uh, here it is, it, it came out great. And I'm uh, really, really happy with the B29, 3D B29. Uh, we've been able to use it in other projects, including uh, as a basis for artwork for challenge coins and a, a new patch we have for the Diamond Little Century Club. So that's kind of neat that we can use it in other ways. And because I have a B29, I can make other B29. So here you have the Enola Gay, just not a little extra texture mapping and some tweaking. And it's very weird to be at home making a little boy in your room in 3D. That, <laughs> it's kind of an odd, odd feeling. But uh, and I also have a picture of Fifi who, in a movie where she doubled as Enola Gay. Now you also have Doc. So now you have Doc, the other B29, uh, flying out of Solana, Kansas, I think. And so they have flown together a few times. This is a shot from Oshkosh by Scott Slocum. And I've appropriately put them together in 3D. Uh, so we're going to jump into 3D printing here for just a second. I tried to print a 3D Fifi about in 2015. This little model took six hours and 15 minutes to print. So the technology back then was just kind of getting started. Also, it comes out looking like this. You have to trim all of this off because there need to be supports under the model when it's drying or the wings will sag or fall off. So and when it comes out, it's kind of like a weed eater line. So it's not hard to cut. In fact, I got cuts all over my hand just from using pliers and whatever, uh, scissors and stuff to get it off. So I trimmed it and this is the final model. But I've had a more, more success more recently. I made a 3D Bell X1 and I wanted to 3D print it. Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier October 14th, 1947. I thought that'd be a great 3D model subject. So. I was able to take my 3D B29 Fifi and I was able to modify it to make Fertile Myrtle the plane that dropped the Bell X1. So I just had to gut the Bombay a little bit. They needed to create space for the Bell X1 to be tucked up in there. And then you have, uh, I found the decals on the internet, which is neat because I used them to, as the basis for the texture map. And so you can see my rendering here and Chasing the Demon, I used that because uh, the pilots back then thought a demon lived at the end of the sound barrier. And so, uh, and there's a book I've written that's really good called uh, with Chasing the Demons, a title uh, by Dan Hampton, I think. Uh, this is the 3D model. So it came out really good. And I made it into pieces. Uh, here you can see the model with the supports I talked about and then the base. So I put it together, painted it. I made it approximately 148 scale so I could use the decals from plastic model kits to, for the 3D printed model and displayed at the Frontiers of Flight Museum. And then uh, Steve and I are talking the Beeman's Gum story. It's kind of fun because it's in the movie where uh, Jaeger borrows the gum from the flight engineer because he's gonna give it back later, which is the mythos from the book too, that a test pilot, they borrow something up here around to give it back later. <laughs> so I got some Beeman's Gum, which is actually pretty good. In fact, our squadron leader, Archie, told me he likes it too. Uh, so my biggest scale model I've ever made of B29 is going Jesse. And this is the uh, one flown by our, my dear friend and a uh, dear friend of the CAF, Charles Chauncey. So he flew uh, going Jesse, um, gr great career, flew the firebombing missions, very, very brave man. And uh, I know his wife, Mary. Uh, so I had a chance to make the model and he, he signed it at a B29 ground school. And then I showed him the 3D rendering and here's a picture of Chauncey and when he was uh, flying B-29. And uh, I showed it to him, I go, Chauncey, what else can I do to make this look even better? And he said, why don't you add some little friends? So little friends, fighters. So I took my P-51 model and I made some of the uh, very long range P-51s from Iwo Jima, escorting Chauncey and it, it won a third place in our contest. This is a major tap. He was our first ace over Japan. And then I got a chance to meet another amazing veteran uh, Captain Jerry Yellen, he flew the P-51s that escorted Chauncey, and he's uh, a great guy. He flew the last mission of World War II, and his wingman was killed. So that really bothered him, and he um, became an advocate for 
uh, meditation and other techniques to help him with PTSD and other veterans. So great man. He also wrote several books. And then interestingly enough, his son married a Japanese girl that was the daughter of a Japanese fighter pilot. And so that all helped him heal from the war. But he uh, died a couple of years ago. I got a chance to see him and he signed my scale model. So what an honor to make 3D models of two heroes you admire so much and put them in the same team together. So that's what I've done here. So that's really the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for being a great audience. I'm happy to take questions. If you yep. go to my website, I got a uh, 1940s rural airfield you can explore and I've made the whole camp from mesh in 3D and here's some contact information for me. Also, if you want more um, information on how to get your supplies together to make scale models, or I can try to tell you something about 3D, although I may not as edgy as I used to be. I'm happy to talk to you if you email me about how to get started, especially with the scale modeling. So that's a great thing to do. And do it with your kiddos if you've got kiddos that uh, would want to scale models. Such a great hobby, connects you to history. But I'm going to shut up and let Steve <laughs> ask any questions. You know, I had a lot of fun. Thank you. Good, good. Well, as you're as you're putting together the 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 3D uh, models and the battleship was the, the first one I thought about. What um, what is uh, or how many different sub com or sub assemblies in the battleship, for instance, were there that you had to put together to get the whole thing? Do, do you remember? Oh, uh, a lot. I mean, every every little every little gun. The thing that makes it great though is that cloning, because mm -hmm. once you've made one big turret. You have four, right. and so um, I even made the um, Arado, uh planes, the float planes that were on the Bismarck. Mm -hmm. and so I made one and two, but sometimes they're not in the scene. You can hide an object because I think they were in the in the hangars when they were fighting the hood. They didn't have planes out on deck, but um, every search slide, every little piece, because I'm looking at the model instructions or the model itself, and I'm replicating things just. It, it's kind of like scale modeling too. You just got to do it. You got to pace yourself and work at it. Uh, the nice thing about 3D models, you don't have to wait for paint or glue to dry, but it's just about pacing. It's like project management, Steve. Sure. So it, that was a very complex model though. So I was really pleased with it. Uh, just off the top of your head, how long did it take to, uh, to create that? That one, probably a month. Okay. Month, you know, the thing about doing any project where you're obsessed with it, and uh, your wife doesn't mind a glowing light until four in the morning off in the corner. <laughs> um, sometimes you just get in the zone and you just work, work, work until you right. go, oh God, I got to go to bed, work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, let's see. Um, our chat, my chat box just moved on me. Um, have you ever done interiors of aircraft? Uh, yeah, well, I've had it, like a few of them where I've had open cockpits. I did a a little bit of a what do you call it, the Rata, the I sixteen, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I put a pilot in there too because that had an open cockpit, right? Okay. But not that much. I, even the mash camp, people ask me, "Oh, can you go into the swamp and go into the tent, and see the skill and all that?" No, I, I really haven't. I, I kind of want to. Um, if you do have an open window, that was one of the things interesting about Fertile Myrtle because. I really couldn't find any good pictures of what the interior of the bomb bay looked like after they gutted it for that Bell X1. And here I have a dropping Bell X1. So should I see things in the bomb bay? But I kind of cheated because I figured it was in heavy shadow. So I, the other thing, you can use texture mapping to really make something look complex. Like it could look like it got metal ribbing or, right. you know, bolts or whatever. You, but that's actually artwork that's on it. So it, it simulates that. And that's why models you can get away with it and not have all the complex pieces like every hair on the head or something if you were to make it a texture map and put it on the model then it's just a 2d image okay. so it's just you got to really think about your project and if you have a model that's too big to manage you may not be able to open it at the end because the computer would choke the yeah. size of the project <laughs> is uh, is there a place uh, that 3d modelers can share files back and forth are there exchanges yeah, I, I've been on Facebook. I'm on the Strata site. Um, I, I probably used to be more active, especially when I was at film school doing that. Uh, and there's some, there were some great models at film school. Of course, the guys who made Mist and that, all that stuff. But um, I don't know, and I'm, I'm kind of not doing the uh, dragons and the mythical creatures and everything. 
I'm doing World War II, but there, I've, I've actually corresponded with some 3D modelers, like a really good B-29 modeler uh, that's out in Atlanta. Um, I can't remember his name. He also made a fantastic Blackbird SR-71, which I gave a print to um, one of our speakers once that he sent out here. Um, I can't remember his name. But So I've, I've probably met more people over Facebook that like to make 3D models, but also like to make models of aircraft and, and subject like that. That's how I connect, because I don't really do the fancy games. Actually, I get too much motion sickness when I play games now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of our uh, viewers is wondering if you ever thought about making a, a graphic novel uh, about the aircraft that you've modeled. Ah, you have. Actually, I'm thinking about that maybe as a future career uh, move for me because ah. I, I'm getting close to retirement age. And I actually picked up a book recently, uh, Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors, done as a graphic novel. And I've seen some stuff from Osprey about Pearl Harbor. But I really, I kind of have a heart for the story like we do at CAF about connecting with youth. You know, I got the big carrier that I take to air shows and have some fun with the kids, but I uh, really think graphic novels would be a great way to tell a story and in particular attract a younger crowd to that story uh, in a way that would intrigue them and maybe want them to search out more, but not maybe take it to the extreme. Uh, right now, you got to watch, you got to know what your boundaries are, but uh, there's so many heroic stories from World War II. I'd love to do some about uh, Chauncey or Jerry Gellin or, oh, uh, uh, General Bond, or you know, there's got to be some stuff. There's so many untold stories, and they be make some great graphic novels. So, hey, who wants to help me? I got an email. <laughs> let's get let's put a project together. I'm happy to work with somebody. There we go. Uh, if someone's interested in getting started, what uh, what's maybe one or two, three, whatever uh, of the best programs uh, for a beginner, and then maybe something moving up the the line. Yeah, I've uh, I will tell you, I work for a community college. Uh, unless you're doing any of this in, in your, you know, before your K through 12, um, definitely go to a community college and take classes and see what you like. And uh, some of them are using different things for like AutoCAD or SolidWorks or Rivet for uh, industrial architecture, industrial design. And those are great. And that's a great way to make a lot of money. Game design is not going to be a tougher thing to break into uh, because of the market being so interesting and, and fluid and so forth. But um, I've heard Blender pretty good. It's an organic modeler. That's something you might look at. Uh, a lot of the softwares too might have a, a software light version you can try. I love Strata because it's so it's so visual and user friendly. They use a lot of icons. The ones that look like computer programming or code, I can't handle that. This messes my brain too much. So uh, look for something where the interface really connects with you. But um, highly recommend taking a class. The class if you take a beginner class. The teacher might be a little more up on that, some of this free stuff than I am, but uh, check it out. I When I taught my class, we had a great time, and Calgary True Space was a great beginning program at that point. Now, like it and Strata and some others maybe aren't as popular as the high-end ones that you can buy now, like Maya, Soft Image. Those are the ones that are making the uh, movies and the games, but they're also taught at community colleges because, I don't know, the price uh, of those... Uh, are what they are, but you'd have to decide, do I really want to invest in this software? What am I going to do with it? So you're right, Steve, I think sampling something for free and just doing a little research on your own and downloading something might be a good start and definitely take a class. All right. Um, are there some parts that are more difficult to render uh, than others? Well, the hard part sometimes has been um, if you have well, in some of my cases, if you have the uh, the texture map might bleed through an image, you have to sometimes manipulate it so things on the other side don't have a, a mirror image of, of like words or, or numbering. Um, so that's, you have to kind of think about it. Sometimes you only see my model from one side, so I'm too lazy to go and try to create a second piece or something. The uh, cockpit for the B-29 was a challenge because I was trying to lay it over the uh, the cone and it's a not quite perfect. I think it's acceptable. At least I hope it's acceptable. But because what at one point it's going to start to bleed into the other shape. So the cockpit of the B twenty nine was pretty hard for me because of the shape of it. Other other things I know that people are hard to do. Obviously, if you see mine, <laughs> <laughs> he looks like he's got a few problems with his face. <laughs> uh, what what kind of glue uh, do you use to assemble the three D uh, printed uh, models? 
Well, you don't use glue. It um, okay. it feeds like um, and I've heard even libraries you can do some 3D printing. I don't know really how they they parse that out with the uh, general public or how you bring in your files. That's an important point too. The uh, I need a little help with my Bell X1 because I made it in what was called a DXF format, which is common for, for Strata, but you have to convert it to, I think it's what's called an STL format, .STL, for the uh, 3D printer to recognize it. So I got some help to do that from an AutoCAD instructor. I'd love to learn AutoCAD. And then you um, instruct it and it just kind of builds it from the bottom up. It creates a boat, the bottom, that's the platform, and that builds it from the bottom up. So you want to think about it, like I've talked to my friend who helped me with this, and we thought about making a much bigger B29 and making it in parts and then gluing it all together later and having a bigger model because the, the one we have at work now is about the size of a mini fridge, but the one you saw in the picture I showed you was much smaller. And now they're 3D printing houses, so <laughs> I mean, it's a, the technology's come a long way and even 3D printing metal. And I hear UNT has an amazing lab. I need to get up there and see it. Uh, but I, I wish if I was much younger, I'd probably be doing that for a living. And I think that's such go. cool tech. Well, good. Well, that uh, wraps up the, the questions. Let me just double check here. Um, yeah, I think that, that gets all the uh, questions that we had from our, our audience tonight. Again, um, you've got your uh, your website and uh, and everything on, on the screen there. And as you said at the, at the opening, you'd be happy to answer anybody's questions uh, as as they come up, as they uh, get into the world of, of uh, 3D. Absolutely. And any any final it's thoughts fun. before we? It's really, yeah, it's a passion I've been able to take take to the next level. So it's great. And uh, come to the real planes too, the one to one scale ones. <laughs> yeah, uh, we can help with that. <laughs> well, you you have to see the the real ones to get pictures, so you can do your your rendering, right? That's right, and that's what I do. If you get a visual library, you have to do that, and then <laughs> go and make it. But um, uh, I I I answered a lot of questions about modeling PP. So if anybody has a question, let me know. The scale modeling PP. In particular, and I everybody always asks me for decals because <laughs> there aren't any yet. <laughs> right. Care of that somehow. Well, good. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Khan. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us tonight. And uh, don't forget to uh, click the like and subscribe or follow buttons so we can let you know about uh, any upcoming shows. As always, if you have any ideas for uh, future topics, airplane you'd like to uh, hear about or a, a story you'd like us to investigate, just send uh, Leah Block an email at media at uh, cafhq.org. Thanks again to Con Kelly for uh, being our guest tonight. And until next time, for the Grim Raid of Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Have a good night.